Hi everybody, welcome to TEDx Red Hill. Thank you for joining. Thank you for being part of the future and taking part in a, a TEDx conference which is entirely online. Very exciting for me to be part of this. Um, my name is Michael Smith. I'm an artist, an educator, a writer. And over the last five or so years, I've used social media fairly successfully to build a market to build a niche for myself, to build a persona online for myself in a way which is now starting to show incredible benefits and, and, and bear fruit. Um, so my interest in contributing to, to the TEDx conference was to kind of give you some insights and benefits of my experience about how one can navigate a changing art world. In 2020, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of global market slowdown moment, um, in a moment where COVID-19 has obviously hampered a lot of people's economic act activities and plans, um, and in a moment where a lot of galleries and a lot of exhibition spaces are closing, shutting doors. Um, so the first thing we need to look at if, we if we're going to understand, you know, where I'm headed is, is the gallery dead? I don't think that the gallery is dead. I don't think that it would be seemly of me to kind of pronounce the death of the, of the gallery. I think that the gallery in pockets and in parts of the world is incredibly healthy. I think, you know, the, the kind of great gallery cultures all around the world. And when I put this thing on Facebook, when I put the blurb for this talk on Facebook to kind of do a bit of pre-publicity amongst my own kind of circle of friends, um, which I might add is about 4,000 people on Facebook. Um, and I built that up over a very long period of time. Um, one lady said to me, oh, you know, this is really tragic. You're talking about the demise of the gallery. The bricks and mortar gallery is one of my favorite places in the world. And, you know, I completely concur with her. I'm, I'm certainly not religious, but I kind of feel like the gallery is, a, is a, a sacred space for me. I feel like it's a space of aesthetics. It's a space of debate. It's a space of kind of people, a, a space where debate very often starts, you know, it becomes kind of like a a jumping off point for a lot of incredibly interesting thinking and, and, and doing. So I would hate to see the demise of the gallery, but I think we have to be realistic. I think we have to be realistic if we want to sustain ourselves in the art world. Um, you know, one can quote all sorts of doomy figures about the number of galleries and the number of dealerships that are closing every year. But, you know, I think if you do your own research, you can find, certainly find a bunch of stuff like that. If you contact me on Facebook and Instagram, I can point you in the right direction. But I think that it's, it's incredibly obvious that things are moving this way. Um, the art world has seen an incredible boom in the last sort of 10 years post 2010. Uh, you know, it's kind of, swings and roundabouts. Some years it, it, it dips a bit, but overall, you know, the, the takings of the art world have risen massively. Um, why has it not trickled down to the bottom end of the, gal of, of, of the system, of the gallery system and the art world? Um, the reason is very often that the, the, the big ticket prices at the top tend to kind of take the, the lion's share of the spend. Um, and also that the bigger galleries tend to be quite cannibalistic. They tend to kind of wait until smaller galleries have done a bunch of R&D on their artists, developed their artists up, got the young artists to the point where they're, they're profitable. Um, and the big galleries tend to kind of swoop in at that point and take those artists and, um, and kind of make the real money off them. So your smaller galleries are very often caught in the cycle of developing artists, investing in them, growing them intellectually and aesthetically and then ending up in a situation where they, they kind of have to hand them over to, to, to the, the bigger parent, you know, the, the guy who's kind of got more money and never really making the money off them that they should. So what does this mean for us? It means that there is less money at the bottom end of the market and the middle of the market. It means that, you know, um, with less money comes closed doors, fewer exhibition opportunities, fewer venues. Uh, fewer places that we can go with our kind of portfolio of work under our arm, like many, many well-established artists have done in years gone by, and kind of lay the work out and say, you know, give me a chance. Um, and even if you did get a chance, I kind of wanted to dispel that myth. Even, you know, a lot of people kind of, it's the same in the music world. People kind of do this thing where they go, well, if I could only get that exposure, I could get my foot in the door, they'd hear me and that would be, you know, that would be my career made. If, you know, if I could get onto idols and they, I could, not get the wooden mic and <laughs> kind of like get that that opportunity it'll it'll all kind of happen from then people have the same kind of stars in their eyes in the art world and i 
I kind of think, well, let's play that scenario out for you a little bit. Let's say you were a young emerging artist and you had 20 works on a show, solo show. 20 works is a good number of, of works on a show. Um, and those works were averaging at around 5,000 rand a piece. Maybe you had some that were two, 3,000. You had others that were 10, 15,000, but they averaged out to about 5K each. If you sold all of those works, which is kind of unheard of to have a sellout show, you would make 100K. All right, 100,000 rand. Between 35 and 50% of that would go to the gallery, which means that you're left with maybe 50,000, maybe 65,000 rand. Um, maybe they take some other work from you and they sell it on consignment and they make you an extra 30K. That's the end of the story for that year. So maybe you sit with, you know, 95,000 rand, 85 to 95,000 rand for that year. That's before expenses. That's before you've done anything, before you paid for framing, before you paid for studio space, before you've kind of fed your, your cat. Um, and you end up in a situation where you're not really making enough money to, to have a sustainable living. Um, and inevitably what happens is that people kind of circle that kind of system for a few years and eventually they give up. And that's the tragedy, you know. And I, what I'd love to see is for more and more of us to be able to kind of sustain what we're doing. I think the big step is, first of all, to think about what you want from the art world. Do you just want to make work and get it out there? That's completely admirable if you do. You know, if you sell a few works, that's wonderful. It's a great form of validation. Or do you really need to sell work to survive? You know, do you, do you, is this part of a, a, a bigger mix of things that you need to, to do to survive? But it's an important part and you need to sell work. Um, if so, you need to be very realistic with yourself. You need to say to yourself, is there a market for what I'm making? Um, are there people out there willing to buy it? You know, am I sort of going beyond the, the kind of circle of love that is my parents and my friends who say, wow, you're brilliant and everything that emits from your, your paintbrush or your charcoal stick is, is fantastic. Um, and, and are you making things that are going out into the world? And are you pricing fairly? Do you understand that you're up against Mr. Price that will sell, you know, two abstract prints to, to somebody for 1,500 Rand total and, you know, throwing a candle at the, <laughs> at the same time? Are you, are you able to fight in that, in that market? Um, if you've decided that all of these things, you know, you, you've ticked a lot of these boxes, you kind of, you know where you're headed, you're realistic about what you're doing, where should you go? you should go digital. Um, in 2018, uh, an arts organization estimated that, or, or actually kind of checked, researched that there was about $4.6 billion worth of digital work that had changed hands. Um, that was in 2018. And they estimated that that was gonna almost double to about $9.3 billion by 2020. 24. This is a wave you cannot ignore. You need to go digital. Um, and in fact, I'd estimate that that price is higher. You know, I certainly am probably part of a, a, an in informal market of, of work selling on Facebook and Instagram. You know, I'm not declaring that through any kind of researchable channels. So, and there's a lot of people like me. So where do you start? How do you create a presence online that's going to kind of put you out there and get you noticed, you need to start with your profile picture. This is incredibly basic stuff. This is social media 101. Start with your profile picture. Um, scroll through Facebook yourself. Look at Instagram yourself. See which images stand out for you. Inevitably, it's a profile picture of a person. If you put a, a profile picture of your artwork, it tends to be too small um, and people kind of scroll past and they don't really have a sense of, of, of you. Um, you also need to understand that people who are buying work online or, yeah, online, I suppose in any kind of context, are buying into you, they're buying into your story and your identity as much as the work. Um, people love to tell the story about the artist that they bought from. They love to tell the story about the circumstances under which they bought the artwork. You kind of have to play that game to a certain extent. Um, you know, be careful of over-sexualizing your images, but your, your profile images, but but certainly try to find something that's that's attractive that kind of makes you stand out from most other people. Post regularly, um, and it doesn't always have to be about art. You don't always have to be posting about art. I mean, I think one of the things that I've realised is I post 
you know, very off stuff, funny memes, um, really interesting articles that I find, uh, insights that I've generated. And I think that what happens over time is that people get a, a sense of the whole you. You know, you're not just sort of this, this cipher or this, this thing that sells art. You're also a person. Um, and over time, you, you build a persona that, that sort of works. Uh, you, and again, you have to realize that it happens over time. Um, yeah, one of the, I kind of repeat to myself a tiny bit here, but one of the ways that, 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 that you find a market on, online is by having a persona and kind of almost weeding out people who you know, maybe you don't agree with or maybe you kind of can't get along with. I'm not saying that you need an echo chamber online, but, you know, people kind of accord with the way you see the world and, and, um, and kind of understand where you're coming from and are able to use that to contextualize what you make. That becomes incredibly powerful. Be cautious, but don't shy away from controversy. I think one of the big problems with people's presence online, you know, people kind of doing basic social media marketing, is that they tend to kind of want to flatten out all the differences and they kind of tend to want to corporatize their own public image. And I don't think that that works either. I think that you are a person. I think that you, you know, you have your good days and your bad days. Um, and then there's also other technical stuff that relates to that. If, you, if you're posting something which is, you know, maybe contentious or creating a bit of debate or whatever it may be, the chances that people are going to kind of comment on what you're, what you're talking about is greater. And the algorithm gods seem to smile down on people on posts that are, uh, that get sort of real engagement, kind of valuable engagement where people are commenting, not just kind of likes and loves. Um, so... And then what, what that's going to mean is that the next time you post artwork, the algorithms are going to smile on you again, probably going to show, share you with a, a broader market um, or a broader audience that hopefully will become a market. Again, don't shy away from standing for causes. Um, you know, stand up around, you know, particularly, you know, I think gender-based violence and, and things like Black Lives Matter and, you know, those my personal kind of no, certainly not soapboxes. I don't think it's my place to have those as soapboxes, but I certainly have feelings about those and I'm not afraid to express those and I'm not afraid to engage in debate around those things. Um, I think if it comes from a place of authenticity, then people can sense that. I think if you're kind of trying to use uh, current debates to, you know, cynically to kind of leverage space for yourself in the markets, then that's, that's a whole different thing and I wouldn't really go there. Um, then the big event, what do you do when you're uploading work? You upload good quality images of attractive work that reads well on social media. You type your comments and your, and, and your kind of like empirical data about your artwork accurately. You know, art buyers tend to be intellectual people. They tend to be sort of fairly educated people. They're going to spot a mile away if you're sort of, you know, your post is riddled with inaccuracies and, and, and poor spelling and things like that. Um, if you spot a mistake, have no shame in running in and editing. I do it all the time. <laughs> I edit things where I've kind of typed on my phone um, in between a meeting and then realize that I made a mistake. I kind of edit it immediately or I delete and start again. Um, try to keep a certain consistency to the way you post. One of the things that I think works really well for me is to post uh, a bit of context around the work that I'm posting. So I don't just post a picture of a drawing. Um, I tend to say how I made it or what I was thinking about when I made it and how it relates to maybe something broader, even, you know, if that thing that's broad is, is my own body of work or a series of work that people have been watching. It kind of creates a dialogue with people, even if they're not actually talking to you. I very often will get contacted by people in, you know, my DMs and people will kind of say, well, I've been watching your work over a long period of time. And I had no idea that they were doing that. Um, so do that. I think it's very valuable to do that. Um, Manage the responses. Facebook and Instagram tend to love it when you respond properly and, and intelligently to people and not just say thank you, thank you, thank you, but kind of, you know, talk to people. Um, be gracious, be grateful, be authentic in your responses. I think those are really important things to be. Um, give people more detail if they ask for it, but don't overload your comments and don't overload your initial posts with information. You have to remember we exist in an information uh, sorry, sorry, in an attention economy uh, where people will scroll, you know, even if they love you, you're the best person, they'll scroll, man, I promise you, straight over your stuff. 
um, if, if they get bored. And if a sale happens, and I'm going to end on this, if a sale happens, if somebody kind of steps up and says, right, here's cash money, or here's digital cash money, um, how do we do this? Have a plan ready. You know, say PostNet to PostNet, or have a way to get the work to them. Deliver work, hand deliver work, I find is an incredibly good form of marketing as well. So if they're in the city that you that you live in, um, hand deliver the work to them. Uh, one last thing that I have used in my own online sales practice is uh, offering payment plan. So give people sort of, you know, if you're selling work for 5,000 Rand, lucky like you, first of all, give them five months to pay it, 1,000 Rand a month. Um, in, in the five years that I've been doing this, I've had two people renege on payments. And if you consider that every business has to kind of shoulder a certain degree of risk, um, I don't think that that's, you know, untoward risk to shoulder. I hope that my talk today has given you uh, some insight into how to use social media, why you should be using social media, how to get out there with it. Um, obviously, you know, in the 15 minutes that I've used, I should have only used 10. Adam's going to give me hell about this. Um, I can't cover everything, so contact me. Uh, Facebook, I'm Michael Graham Smith. On um, Instagram, I'm Michael, sorry, at Mike underscore G underscore Smith. Um, let me know how you found the talk. Let me know if it was valuable for you. Uh, if you have any kind of add-on insights that you'd like to share with